The best thing about Inverness is its compact size. The best accent in the whole of Scotland. They say, how you doing? No bad yourself. Inverness is famous for... Well, I'm not going to say Loch Ness. Loch Ness Monster? I believe in the Loch Ness Monster because I've actually seen sight of it. It's usually by the time you get halfway down the bottle of whiskey. It's probably a log. The worst thing... The weather sometimes. The wind. Right. The daylight hours are great in the summer and they don't exist in the winter. He says, have you seen the Loch Ness Monster? I have seen it. I was married to it for 25 years. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much and welcome to Mark Stills in Town, which this week comes from the tropical shores of Inverness. Uh, <laughs> A paradise that's ideal to retire in, as some days in winter it stays light for nearly four minutes. But, <laughs> but I should start properly, as it's Inverness, by saying, Aye, aye, Inverness, how you doing? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you seen it, man. <laughs> Because we're so far away from hectic life up here that you go through all that rather than just say hello <laughs> to while away a few more seconds of your day. <laughs> you must get a little bit cross with the sort of London image. The London people come up here now and, of course, people get completely confused because London people think of Inverness as just being like three cottages and a shepherd. <laughs> And if there is a branch of PC World, that's run by a shepherd who goes, oh, or a USB stick, you see. <laughs> I'll get my collie to fetch one. <laughs> <laughs> and this must be annoying, the stupid English view of the Highlands, where you think of Inverness as full of nothing but tartan sweaters and malt whiskey. And Inverness is clearly about much, much more than that. And that's why the first shops, as you cross the main bridge there... <laughs> The Tartan Sweaters, the malt whiskey shop, a shop called Tartan Tweeds that advertises itself as the cheapest kilt hire, and all around are adverts telling tourists to experience Inverness by going on the Nessie Dolphin and Whiskey Tour. <laughs> because that pretty much covers everyday life in Inverness, doesn't it? <laughs> you get up early in Inverness, you feed your dolphins, and you have a wee dram of malt and take a blurred photo of the monster that could be a stick, and that's your task done for the day. <laughs> There are a few quaint customs to charm the outsider. For example, one online comment on a website advising tourists says, before you arrive, make sure you remove the indicators from your car to blend in with the locals. <laughs> Although your lovely charm, quaint little Inverness, you're also the capital of the Highlands. So to the rest of the Highlands, you're this huge city. You're like the corner shop for everyone within 200 miles. <laughs> People from Stornoway get a jeep and a ferry and a donkey and a train to come and buy 300 toilet rolls and a thousand Twixies and, and the newspapers for a year ago. Oh, Donald Trump, I see you got in. <laughs> And this means you have a warm, grand sense of superiority as a major centre, even though if you were this size anywhere normal, you'd be a village. <laughs> Travelling across the north of Scotland to get to Inverness isn't particularly difficult. For example, there's the case of Kay Yore, who lived in the lighthouse at Cape Roth, and her journey was written about on the BBC website. A woman who left her remote home in the Scottish Highlands to buy a turkey for Christmas has finally got back home 30 days after she set out. <laughs> she left for Inverness on the 23rd of December and, due to heavy snow, couldn't get home until January the 19th. <laughs> Now, who could possibly have predicted the Highlands of Scotland might be icy in December? <laughs> the image of, of Inverness as being only a distant remote settlement must get very, very frustrating. In an article about moving up here from London, someone wrote, One problem we found is many delivery firms don't count Inverness as UK mainland and slap on extra charges. Yes. Is that what they do? Yes. How do they justify that? They go, no, our bloke definitely remembers going over the sea to get there, you mate. <laughs> he was surprised when he got there that he hadn't needed a boat, but... Uh... <laughs> So some things you see as normal here will puzzle lots of people from the southern cities because you're, you're a hard bunch. You have to be to be up here. I've seen this in March, Friday and Saturday nights, people sitting outside at night by the river at Johnny Fox's bar. What's the matter with you? <laughs> 
<laughs> You're a half an hour drive from the North Pole. Is this so polar bears think, oh, I'm not going to try and eat that old bastard. He sits outside in March. <laughs> One of the favourite stories of the town is about the woman who lived in a care home on the riverfront who had a Zimmer frame taken off her because she was using it to escape from the home and go to the pub. But the next night, she was found in the pub again having rolled down using a wheelie bin as a Zimmer frame. <laughs> combination of locally prestigious, nationally small, old, but with a crack at new means the Scotsman was able to report studies show that Inverness is the second happiest place in Britain. <laughs> now, that's why you're not first, isn't it? <laughs> the first is Harrogate and they'd all go, oh, fantastic, we're happiest place in Britain. <laughs> hey, we're second. That'll do. <laughs> Falkirk was fifth. <laughs> oh, look at you, just oozing happiness. How dare they be fifth? We hate them. <laughs> Glasgow and Edinburgh were outside the top 50. <laughs> Sheared you up a bit, innit? <laughs> Why are you so happy then, Vaness? Although you've probably gone down to seventh already, if they <laughs> It's a glorious part of the Inverness character, I think. This mix of small, charming Highland town and regional ruthless dominance. <laughs> it's a perfect balance. Historic but slightly modernised, biggest in the area but still compact. Or as it says on TripAdvisor, Inverness is a modern town with nothing much to see. <laughs> This is the part of the mix of Inverness, as far as I can see. It's like you're modern enough to have an airport, but it's a quaint little airport. The airport's own website says, not the biggest of airports, the services it boasts are a cash point machine and a shop selling newspapers. <laughs> Which makes your airport considerably smaller than the average branch of Spa. <laughs> And another side to transport here is that taxis don't just take people to the station, they take them on massive tours for several days. And we're lucky enough to have a representative of the local taxi community. Yes. And Sheena, so you're from... Uh, Inverness Taxis. Inverness, oh, beautifully named Inverness Taxis. <laughs> uh, the first thing I love about your taxi firm is the number you have to dial. Yeah, you just keep pressing two till someone answers. Yeah. <laughs> Is that because you, you think people are just too stupid here? <laughs> Put a three in it and they go, oh, I can't be bothered to remember all that. <laughs> I'll walk to the Black Isle. <laughs> and when you take sort of various tourists that you take around, a lot of Americans, presumably? Oh, an awful lot of Americans. <laughs> a few years ago, I had a couple of elderly Americans in the car. <laughs> they were in the late 70s, early 80s, and I had the mishap of having them on a Saturday night between the hours of 8 and 9 o'clock at night, which I had better things to do. Yeah. So I took... You can tell this is the happiest town in Britain. <laughs> <laughs> so I took them everywhere I could think of, started heading towards the cathedral, sitting at the bridge. At this point, the seals come in. They come in to chase the fish, and they go up and down the river. We were used to seeing them, but they weren't. So she sort of looked out the window and said, oh, gee, girl, what's that in the water? So I just said, well, it's Nessie's babies. <laughs> and she said, G Nessie's babies? Are you sure? I went, yeah, yeah, they're there every week. They're, oh, it's Saturday night. That's the right time for them. <laughs> Disappeared out of the car. Off they went. Eventually, started already, I got them back in the car and I says, right, where do you want to go now? She says, we'll go back to the hotel, if that's all right. We want to show everybody this. <laughs> uh, went, oh. oh, no. <laughs> started to get scared there. <laughs> Took them back to the hotel and just as I pulled up, I says, now I'm sorry, I'm going to have to confiscate your camera, delete all these photographs. I've got to get rid of the film. <laughs> and she went, what, my, what pet? And I says, if you put that out on YouTube, we'll have scientists from all over the world. They'll take the babies away. There'll be no more tourism. Oh, the whole of the town will shut down. And she's like, oh, my God. Well, she handed me the camera. And I went, oh, no, what am I going to do now? <laughs> <laughs> so I said to her, well, I'll tell you what, if you promise me that you will not show this to anybody, I'll let you keep it, but you must promise me it. And she went, I will, pet, I will. And I gave her back the camera and she gave me a £50 tip. <laughs>
Thanks very much. And thanks very much to Sheena. And thanks, everybody, for clapping what was an admission of extortion, blackmail... <laughs> ..and various other crimes. One problem with driving round here is that some roads go through woodlands that are inhabited by millions of suicidal deer. <laughs> Sheena, deers? Do you have lots of your taxis driving to deers? Unfortunately, yes, but you can get little stickers now. <laughs> There's a few of the taxis in town have them. You get a little sticker with a cross on it. It's like you can stick it in your window if you've hit a deer. <laughs> it's just joy, joy, happiness, joy. <laughs> So one of the quirks of, of Inverness that must make you happy is the architectural policy here, which seems to be to have a beautiful, majestic building, such as a castle, and then complement it by right next door having something shite. Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> you have an elegant river church, and next door the ugliest hotel mercure in the world. <laughs> by the famous old Galleons pub, you put a Primark. The castle is right next to a square, rotten, concrete structure that looks like a hard-to-let flat on an estate in Croydon. <laughs> <laughs> and that one turns out to be the tourist office. <laughs> and according to one local writer, I'm glad that's the tourist office, because while tourists are in there, it means they can't see it from the outside. <laughs> There's a museum in the tourist office. Uh, my favourite items in there are a stuffed puma, which gives you an insight into the local wildlife, and some stuffed seagulls, which is fascinating because it, it offers a unique once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to see what a seagull really looks like. <laughs> when would anyone in Inverness at any other point get the chance to actually view a seagull? <laughs> And then the statues. You've got statues known as the Three Graces that represent faith, hope and charity. And these statues have been loved over the years, but luckily, to cheer you up, the Three Graces are balanced in the classic Inverness way by three concrete office blocks in the middle of town that are lovingly known as... Three Disgraces. The rest of you not know. <laughs> Who's any of you from Inverness? <laughs> you were just brought here by Sheena, who told you that the rottenest monster was going to be unveiled in front of you. <laughs> the castle is even more exciting now. You know you've got a castle. A castle! <laughs> the castle is even more exciting now because you've got a lovely new viewing tower. Are you familiar with the view? Have you been up there? No, I've never been to Inverness before. <laughs> the new viewing tower costs five pounds to go up, as I'm sure you all know, but it's worth it because it does give you a magnificent view across the city and the only other way to get a similar view would be to stand at the top of the hill right next to it for nothing. <laughs> The new viewing tower has been beautifully designed to fit in with the Victorian brickwork and red sandstone of the castle, so you can barely tell where the historic building ends and the new perspex bit begins. <laughs> it's been carefully moulded to look like one of those things you put around a dog's neck to stop it chewing its stitches out. <laughs> And for all the castles and rivers and spots that may or may not have been something to do with King someone or other who was strangled by Macbeth or something, the most important monuments in Inverness are your footbridges that wobble as soon as a butterfly lands. <laughs> and anyone going on it the first time goes, ah! <laughs> I asked people from Inverness to tell me on Twitter the most important point about the town, and one typical reply was, the bridges sugar even more when some bugger on a moped takes a shortcut across it. <laughs> <laughs> if you go on when a line of school kids are coming the other way, it's like playing a game in Gladiators or Total Wipeout, and you expect someone dressed as a chicken to start firing trifles at you. <laughs> You're brilliant at building stuff. I'll tell you this. In 1731, the prison was described by the governor as a bleak building not in good condition. Since I've been there, most murderers and villains sent here have made their escape. <laughs> so a new jail was built, and one of the first groups sent there were five men to be transported to Australia. But, I quote, before the sentence could be carried out, the jail doors were opened by mistake and all the prisoners left. <laughs> You like to be different, Inverness. You're miles away, so you don't have to follow the same rules as normal towns, cos no-one's going to come here and check, are they? <laughs> Similarly, in traditional towns, when it's 12 o'clock, the clock just chimes with a ringing sound, and that seems to do. But here, it sets off a five-minute routine in which... 
in which an elephant jumps over a mermaid and a, a monkey climbs up a giraffe and a penguin does a pirouette, a lion appears to have a stroke. A bedroom door opens and a hippo comes out. And that's how you tell the time in Inverness. But the finest example of doing things differently is that round the world there are a great many lakes, normally involving nothing but water, but with your one you decided to add something. You went for a monster. Do you all believe in the monster? Yes! yes. The first viewing of the monster, apparently, is well, not recently, the first viewing of the monster was in the 6th century. Then in 1933, a Londoner, George Spicer, reported seeing a monster. And then the Inverness Courier reported several people in the area who reckoned that they'd seen a monster. Now, this was just a few months after the original King Kong film had come out, and there was a craze going round the world about monsters, but I'm sure that was just a coincidence. <laughs> In 1934, a surgeon took the famous photo of a shadowy long neck in some water that absolutely proved there was a giant creature living round the corner that had somehow never been spotted before. And the Daily Mail ran a headline, Monster of Loch Ness is not a legend but a fact. Now, this is quite sweet in a way, because in the 1930s, the Daily Mail could often be very supportive towards monsters. And... <laughs> And what anyone who travels round the lock will agree about is the marvellous way that you haven't tried to exploit this flimsy theory. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone here said it? The monster for which you all just said you were definitely sure existed? <laughs> it's like being in church. <laughs> In particular, there's one man who has sat by the lock, living in a van, keeping a lookout for the monster for 26 years. And uh, do you all know him? Yes! He's a star of the area and he's in the Guinness Book of Records for, I quote, the longest continuous vigil hunting for the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> and uh, so I'd like to introduce Steve. Uh, I, uh, Steve. Hi there. Steve Felton, man. That's how long? Am I right? 26 years? 26 years, years and 12 days. And how do you interpret that world record, Steve? I think I'm the world champion at not spotting the Loch Ness Monster, to be honest. <laughs> and, and I suppose, ultimately, it's really a world record in patience. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but if you'd found it after a year, you wouldn't have got the record. True enough, yeah. <laughs> I'd have been able to retire. Yeah. <laughs> best sighting yet that you've had then? What's the nearest you've got? I did see one thing like a torpedo going through the water right. and as it hit each wave all you'd see was a splash of water off each wave and it just shot across my vision. And how long had you been there when that happened? I was in the first year actually oh. and uh, yeah I'm still patiently waiting for the second one. <laughs> but, uh, I did, when I had the first sighting, I thought, gee, this job's as easy as anything. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to have this mystery solved in no time. <laughs> so, uh, what would happen if a load of people come down and sort of next to you? Would that be... Summertime, the campers come and pull in them. If they get a bit too close, I do get like I'm on a housing estate. I do start... <laughs> I used to have a piano in the van, and so I'll make sure that I go to the pub, get drunk, and then clatter about on that piano till <laughs> two o'clock in the morning, thinking, you won't park there again. <laughs> <laughs> was there someone who asked if, you, if you've ever dived down there? <laughs> she was an old lady that got off of one of the tour buses, and she said, all right, and do you ever go diving in the loch? I said, well, I don't really, because if you look at it, the, the water is actually it's quite like Coca-Cola, really. And she looked at me and she said, all oh, right, yeah, too fizzy. <laughs> <laughs> and you've had celebrity visitors. Um, yeah, uh, Jimmy Page was about last week, actually. He was down my van for half an hour. I couldn't get rid of him. <laughs> yeah. See, I think you've been a success, Steve. I think you are a glorious success in a way. Because you, uh, various people have been inspired and that by what you've done. Yeah, every year I meet people that have... What I do has been the catalyst, or the final straw, if you like, that's pushed them over the edge from their, <laughs> from their nine to five job that they maybe don't like to actually doing the thing that they love and the thing that they want to dedicate their life to doing. Steve, thank you. <laughs> Hello.
And I'm sure Steve appreciates, sure we all do, that there must be many, many people who just go, what a crazy way to spend your life wasting 26 years sitting by a beautiful idyllic setting, never having to go to work or be in a traffic jam, while sensible people like me work all year as a wardrobe salesman so I can afford two weeks' holiday somewhere nice, such as the shores of Loch Ness. <laughs> It's beautiful. The, the Montessori is beautiful. And I love Steve looking for it. The whole thing of it. It fits in with the charm of the Highlands history. And there's always been charm in Highlands history. Open any page of history of the Highlands. For example, in 1400, Donald of the Donald clan threatened to burn down Inverness unless he received a ransom. So the provost of Inverness agreed. And the first instalment was several barrels of whiskey for Donald's men. Then, according to the history of Inverness, the provost waited until he knew they'd all be drunk and led a band of stout townsmen and killed them all. <laughs> it's nice when mass murder has a local feel, isn't it? <laughs> right. In 1428, a clan leader called Angus Dub Mackay was arrested along with his followers by the king, and the king composed a poem for the occasion, which is a sweet touch, and I'll read the whole poem. We killed each and every man, let our axe be vindicated, for the chieftain of your clan turned left but never indicated. <laughs> Thankfully, the nasty side of Highlands feuding is long behind you now, and you get charming local tales, such as this one from the Inverness Courier. At a family gathering in Inverness, a man of 34 had a row with his stepdad during Wimbledon as to whether Andy Murray is British or Scottish, so he lost control and bit off his ear, a court urgent. <laughs> because we're happy. <laughs> The more I read about the history up here, the more I wonder if sometimes you're just having a laugh at us from the outside to get back at us. I saw a bed and breakfast called the Glencoe Guest House <laughs> with a board outside saying, Glencoe Guest House for typical Glencoe Highland hospitality. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked up Glencoe hospitality and read this. 38 MacDonalds from the Clan MacDonald of Glencoe were killed in their beds by guests who accepted their hospitality. <laughs> For God's sake, Inverness! I don't mind you killing everyone, but don't call it hospitality. <laughs> Naming your bed and breakfast after it and saying this makes you happy, you psychopaths. <laughs> Is the Glencoe bed and breakfast part of a chain with the Fred West guest house in Gloucester? <laughs> Bringing you a technical Gloucester warm welcome. <laughs> But something that you have built over the centuries is the beautiful structure on the Black Isle known as the Clutie Well. And <laughs> are you all familiar with the delights of the Clutie Well? Yes. Uh, the Black Isle is the bit over the main bridge, the huge road bridge over the Firth that goes out to the sea that's disappointingly sturdy. And <laughs> to get to the Clutie Well, you go across to the Black Isle and after about three miles, don't indicate left and then turn left. <laughs> This is the woods by a well which the Celts decided was a place of healing. So if anyone they knew was ill, they would come to the Clutie well and they would tie a piece of cloth to a branch for them. But it does look amazing there. Thousands of pieces of cloth draped over branches. Although Sheena tells tourists this is where the Virgin Mary hangs out our washing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but my favourite... Favourite tourist attraction you have here in Venice is the glory that is the Titanic Museum. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike other museums that have some sort of official status, <laughs> the Titanic Museum is built in someone's garden at the edge of a canal, and you get to it either by clambering over a gate and some poles or walking by the canal and sliding down a muddy bank, and either way, the health and safety looks considerably worse than it was on the original Titanic. <laughs> The replica boat is made out of old cars and it is magnificently realistic in one important way, which is that if you put it in water, it would definitely sink. <laughs> the exhibits there are wonderful. There are posters of films to do with the Titanic, pictures of the Titanic, and a rivet with a piece of card next to it that says replica of a rivet that may have been... <laughs> that may have been used on the Titanic. <laughs> 
Among the comments on TripAdvisor is some of the play equipment is not ship shape, and I'd advise caution. Oh, come on, it's a replica of the Titanic built in someone's garden. You can't advise caution. You're lucky you don't get chucked in the canal with a bucket of ice and made to listen to Celine Dion. <laughs> To get a sense of how wonderful this whole museum is, when I was talking to Steve, the monster hunter, about it, he went, oh, yeah, that bloke's eccentric. <laughs> it's perfect for Inverness, that place, full of history and passion, but not so soppy and pretty that there's not a risk of serious injury. And this is what the city's about. It's known for battles and monsters and chaotic bridges and scrambling through ice and snow. And you're still loyal to your clans. It's just that now, instead of the McDonald's and McGregor's, you've got the Goths gathered in Falcon Square. <laughs> But the Goths are adding to the economy because Goths across the Highlands have to come here once every three months to buy a bucket of eyeliner. And... <laughs> <laughs> you have to feel for the Goths of Inverness. They've chosen a cult that revolves around blackness and misery and they live in the second happiest place <laughs> in Britain. <laughs> But they balance things. They do, Inverness. They balance your fresh, clean river in the same way that you've got your majestic buildings and you like a concrete block to even things up. You have a magnificent lock, but you like to say there's a monster in it so that it's not too twee. You've got a Premier League football club, but it's in the daftest place by the Firth so that the wind cripples absolutely anybody who's watching. <laughs> Though, to be fair, last season the wind was Inverness Caledonian Thistle's top scorer. <laughs> <laughs> So I will leave you, Inverness, with a chapter from a self-help book called How To Be Happy. And it's obvious, I'd say, that your mostly but not entirely beautiful city has modelled itself very much on these thoughts from this yogic writer. To begin the journey to true happiness, where the contented soul may flourish in harmony with all that surrounds, imagine yourself in a place of beauty with running water, foliage of a deep refreshing hue and majestic buildings and now add a decaying office block and a vandalized garage with smashed windows <laughs> visualize a bridge to all your desires then shake it violently until you're catting yourself <laughs> picture yourself floating in majestically blue water with nothing to disturb you except a vast imaginary humpbacked creature Stay true to your enlightened path, changing course only when you're sure you haven't indicated you're going to. <laughs> and you will surely ascend to a state of happiness even more fulfilled than that that they have in full Kirk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emily. Mark Steele's in town was written and performed by Mark Steele. With additional material by Pete Sinclair. It was produced in Inverness by Carl Cooper. It was a BBC Studios production. Thank you very much.